uh, Dr. W. Bernard Carlson, and he runs the engineering business program in the engineering school at the University of Virginia. The title for his talk is Entrepreneurs as Agents of Change, Lessons Learned from the Technology Entrepreneurship Program at the University of Virginia. Let's please join me in welcoming Dr. Bernard. So uh, I want to uh, thank you all for coming. I also want to thank Dr. Wall for uh, organizing uh, this, uh, this wonderful symposium. It's been very stimulating for me. It's uh, been a chance to find out all sorts of best practices, what we see in Nashville, what's going on at St. Louis University in Hong Kong. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's been you know, a great opportunity for me to come up with lots of different things to take back to my university and to think about. I'm at the same university as Sean Carr uh, that you heard yesterday. Sean is over in the uh, Graduate School of Business. I um, am in, as it shows, shows down there, at the, uh, at the University of Virginia's Engineering School. And to start out, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, something that sh uh, Sean set up for you before, which is the notion that there are both tangible and intangible assets that are necessary for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship education. And I'm going to continue to t the sort of idea that Sean s suggested, which is to think about what are the intangible assets that you need to have for an entrepreneurship program. There's no, and that's what I want to focus on. I want to emphasize that there is no substitute for having the right kind of tech transfer office or, or licensing program at a university or other types of uh, institutional resources. But I want to talk about ideas today. A few, year, a few years ago, uh, we were looking at, or I was talking to an adjunct instructor that I subsequently hired. In fact, he uses Jerry Katz's book. And I said, so why did you, uh, why did you come over and uh, join me in the engineering school? We have two different, two different business schools at the University of Virginia. We have an undergraduate business school, McIntyre School. We have the Darden School. We have lots of different programs. I'll show you a picture of our ecosystem, a diagram at the end. And he said, I'll tell you why I came to the engineering school. Because everybody keeps saying, go see, go see Carlson. He's the guy that has all the crazy ideas. And I want to do crazy ideas, so I came with you. So I'm going to tell you about some of those crazy ideas today. Now, why do I care about crazy ideas? I want to use this picture to start thinking about that right off the bat. That's a, a series of what economists call country of curves. And the idea is, is that across history, remember I'm a historian, there have been a series of technologies that have revolutionized the way we do life. Disruptive technologies that recreate entirely new industries that reorganize how we experience everyday life. For me, the big question, the $64,000 question, is where do those waves come from? Okay. Where, do they, where do they happen in the past? What brought them about? And in particular, what is going to be that fifth or sixth wave? Where are the new disruptive technologies come from? Submitted for your consideration. In my mind, one of the things that you have to consider are who are going to be the agents of change? Who is going to create that fifth or that sixth wave? And I'm going to argue that in part, it's going to be engineers, and engineers who develop a very particular sort of mindset. My university is the University of Virginia. It's a, it's a public university. It's regarded as the uh, flagship university in a state system that's about uh, oh, t uh, 12 or 15 schools. Uh, it's a total of about 21,000 students. And as I said, it has two, two business schools, and it also has an engineering school. The engineering school is about 2,500 students, uh, undergraduate, about 750, 800 uh, graduate students. And uh, we emphasize in our undergraduate program, and most of what I'm going to say today is about the undergraduate program, we emphasize that we are in the business of, of creating leaders of innovation. We do so by emphasizing that we are doing excellence in both terms of the content, the, the analytical, the problem solving, the disciplinary skills that come with engineering. At the same time, we emphasize excellence in context, that we want our students to be able to think about how technology shapes their lives, shapes their communities, shapes the society, shapes entire nation states, and indeed shapes the, shapes the world. How do we get there? In part, we get there because I run a program that is called the Department of Engineering and Society. And Engineering and Society has a number of different, number of different goals. The engineering, school, the engineering school wants to create an entire program of world-class engineers. So there's a set of activities that are, are necessary in order to make that happen. You not only have to have the engineering programs, but you have to have a series of things that augment and supplement what the student is doing. 
And so within the single department of engineering and society, we focus on a variety of things. We teach the technology and society courses. That's how I came to it. We also teach the applied math courses, the introductory engineering courses. We also have the experiential lab, an experiential laboratory where people can do the sort of immersion uh, experiences or learning that, that Michael talked about a little bit earlier this morning. And we, so we do an entire range of things. I'm a great sloganeer, and the slogan I always say for my group, which is now about 38 faculty, is, 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 is that we integrate analysis and judgment. The analysis that you need to be able to solve the problem, to do the sort of rigorous analysis that, uh, that Shiri just, uh, Siri just ex uh, exemplified, but also the judgment. Where do you want to stand in society? How do you want to shape society? In doing so, we, uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, we at the University of Virginia, we have a founder as we would say. And it's, it's, it's Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. And after he uh, had, uh, wrote the Declaration of Independence in 1776, served as president uh, from 1800 to 1807, what do you do for a third act? Well, he decided he was going to create a university, one of the first public university in the United States. And in doing so, Jefferson emphasized from the get-go, and this is 1819, that there were going to be professors of natural philosophy, i.e. what became known as physics, and that the natural philosophy professor was also going to teach something that was entirely newfangled in the early 19th century, a notion of engineering. And Jefferson was interested in that because Jefferson believed that you had to get the economic, the material, the technological basis of your society right if you wanted to reshape the society in particular directions. If you wanted a democratic society, which is what Jefferson wanted, then you had to think very carefully about what kind of technological base you had. And we continue to support that idea and ask our, question, our students continually to you know, consider this issue. How can technology be directed to support the goals of a particular society? In other words, if you want the society to take form and shape in particular ways, think carefully about the innovations that you want to support. Now, one way to get there is to include in that a program like engineering and society aspects of business. And I, indeed, as, as, as my... As, as I was introduced, I run, the, I'm the director of the engineering business programs. We came into the engineering business program because we had a series of alumni, or a number of alumni, who were interested in basically making sure that the students that we, we produced were not only good, if you will, white collar technicians, people that could crunch the numbers, but could also exercise a certain degree of leadership, a certain degree of judgment. And so they asked us to create, about 10 years ago, an engineering business minor, which now has over 350 students in it, out of that population of about 2,000. Uh, but we've also since then created uh, two other programs. One is a technology entrepreneurship concentration, and the other is a single course in business fundamentals for engineers. A course that is designed that if you have a, bu a busy uh, program of, of uh, majors of what you're studying as an engineer and you can only fit one in business course in take this business course it's taught by students from and Sean's school to Darden school where they have a PhD program now I'm going to focus on the technology entrepreneurship program the technology entrepreneurship program and I'm always vitally aware that uh, that it's a crowded marketplace that is as uh, as Jerry Katz said a few moments ago there's something over 2,000 2,000 different programs around the world in entrepreneurship. So why should we create one more at UVA and one more where we have you know, world-class business and uh, graduate business school, we have world-class business schools? And the answer is, 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 is uh, we want to focus on technology entrepreneurship. And we, we come to that by basically bringing together three ideas. And the first is, is that a successful, a thriving global economy is going to depend on a mix of innovations. They're going to be in incremental innovations and they're going to be disruptive innovations. The disruptive innovations are those waves I showed you a few moments ago. The incremental innovations are those very important products that allow a society to take full use of its installed industrial capacity, all of the talents of its people. Now while business schools frequently emphasize and are very good at showing students how to do, how to exploit market opportunities and move towards incremental uh, market-based innovations at SEAS, the School of Engineering, we want to emphasize that it's possible to innovate from the supply side, to exploit engineering knowledge in order to produce disruptive innovations and breakthroughs. Okay, so we want to move from the science, we want to move from what's going on in the laboratory out there to the marketplace. 
And to do that, to create those disruptive innovations, you need agents of change. You need to help your students think about, think of themselves not just as going along for the ride, but able to actually shape things. Now, as I said, we came to this idea of engineers as agents of change by talking to a number of our alumni, some of whom came out of Silicon, or who had, had successful careers in Silicon Valley and, or, or, or other, parts of, uh, other parts of the economy. And they insisted that are, all too often, high-tech companies tend to be run by business people who turn to the geeks, to the technical people, and say, well, give us, give us one more app. Give us one more thing that looks like what the, comp the competition is doing. And they said, that's not the way to go. What we actually want to do is, is, is we want to create engineers who can see the opportunities, that can see what's happening on the bench top in the laboratory or, or you know, in, the computer, in the computer facility, shape those into new, new ideas and practices. Now, to do that, we have to help our students do two things. We have to develop a sense that they can see opportunities. They can, they can discover in the, the breaking science and technology what one of our alumni calls a noble asset. What is that, that one thing that if you really understand it, you can move it out of the laboratory into the, into the marketplace. And then we want to give the students the skills, the insights that they need in order to make that transition. So how's our program structured? As I say, I'm only talking, not talking about the business minor, I'm talking about the technology entrepreneurship concentration. So this is open to all students in the engineering school. Indeed, it's open to all undergraduates at, at our university. They take, they take three required courses, that business fundamentals course, they take a course on the entrepreneurial mindset, that's the middle course, they take a course on entrepreneurial finance, and then they choose an elective from down on the bottom. And what I want to emphasize is, 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 is we've gone this elective path for the curriculum because we really have two populations of students that we're trying to serve. One is, is this a population of students that are already entrepreneurs. They are going to innovate no matter what I tell them to do. I cannot stop them. They are just, you know, stop me before I invent again. Okay, and we want to deliver this just-in-time knowledge that they need in order to keep going. In some cases, the challenge that they have is figuring out how am I going to protect this idea. So they take the intellectual property class. In other cases, they need to figure out how they're going to run the business. How are they going to start up? How are they going to, what's their operations going to look like? Okay, so we have a range of these electives. So that's one population is just for the student entrepreneurs that are already in place. In other cases, it's for students that are going to be managers or consultants or have other types of careers. They're not going to start a small business necessarily, but they're going to work in a large organization and they want to be able to be innovative they want to be able to shape the technology for their particular organization. So we try to do both, both of those things. Okay. Several key themes in the program. Again, I'm an ideas sort of guy, or what I want to emphasize in the few moments I have with you are, are ideas. Okay. One is, is this as we teach from the ideas of Saras Saravathi, or my colleague over in the Darden School, who developed an idea about entrepreneurship that's very different. It's called effectuation. And her notion is, is this is rather than rather than sort of, you know, kind of dealing with the, mar you know, the objective measures of the marketplace, start from a subjective personal spot. What are you good at? What are your strengths? What are your solutions that you already possess? And go out and then find opportunities where you can, you can take advantage of those particular strengths that you have. An important part of that is, 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 is to strive to develop relationships, to be able to talk to lots of different people, venture capitalists, uh, intellectual property people, whoever are the experts that you need in order to realize that idea. For engineering students, that's, that's often a real challenge, is to be able to learn those, those networking skills. Another idea that's important to the way we approach entrepreneurship is, 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 is as I say, under the slogan, to write is to know. That we use a variety of exercises and activities in the classroom, whether it's maintaining an idea notebook, it's doing uh, elevator, elevator speeches, or, or, or what I, I, I learned about them from Babson, so I call them rocket pitches, um, or preliminary patent applications. We have our students do all of those things, not just because they're good communications tools, but because they are an opportunity by which students are able to do two things. One is, is, this, is they're able to form new teams. So every student in my class, for example, does the two to three minute rocket pitch. All of the students hear all of them, and then one day I go in the classroom and I say, nobody gets out of here alive until we've created teams of three or four. Okay, in other words, they form the teams up. And they form the teams up by looking at 
were thinking about the rocket pitches that they heard the week before. I want to team up with that individual. It's not so much that I'm interested in, in that, that young lady's idea as much as I like her style. I like the kind of questions that she asked. I like the rigor that this fellow over here brought to the particular problem. So again, there are team building communication, the documents that we produce are team building exercises. They're also mitigation of risk. Once you've actually written something down, you've made your mind up about it. Once you draw a picture, you're on your way to trying to decide something about it. So it's a way of mitigating risk, I argue. I also want to mention that we also take, you know, you know an approach that that's best explained by using historical cases. And so I've spent a lot of time in my, my career recently writing a, a book that's, uh, that's come out the last spring about Nikola Tesla. The car is named after him. Uh, but he was a famous inventor who had two major disruptive innovations in his career. One was a great success, alternating current, the electric motor. The other was, was his, his, as a rival of Marconi, he was not so successful in, de in developing wireless, wireless technology or what became radio. And Tesla's career suggests several things that I find very useful to talk to students about. And for one, one theme is, is, is that if disruptive technologies are going to have a significant impact, entrepreneurs need to build and negotiate with a variety of groups. They need to form a social network. And Tesla, or historical case, allows you to do that well. So the circle is Tesla or the entrepreneur. And what I'm trying to show in a diagram like this is, is, is do I have... So you, the circle, I'll just, I, want to, I want to make a, a, a simple point about all of this. The circle is the entrepreneur. In this case, it's Tesla. Each of the, the sort of six-sided boxes that are, are, are different social groups that the inventor has to inter, or entrepreneur has to interact with. So you've got business promoters. You've got the company, Westinghouse, that eventually buys his motor patents. You have the professional engineering community down here. You have patent examiners. Okay? And the arrows that go between each of these are about a transaction. That is to say that if, if Tesla wants to get uh, credibility from engineers, so the, the arrow is flowing back from engineers back to Tesla, he has to provide things that work for the engineering community. He has to have theory, he has to have data, so he has to have a working model. And that's very different than the sort of negotiations that he has to have, say, with the patent office. Now, I have my students actually read this case and then go away and begin to diagram what is the network that they have to build in order to see their inventions realized. And it emphasizes for them the social dynamics that go with being an inventor. That the hard work often isn't just getting the little gizmo to work on the bench top, it's building out this whole network. Okay. Another idea is, is, is that entrepreneurs, particularly with disruptive technologies, in that negotiation process often have to mobilize values and ideas of a particular culture. And one of the places that this is really well illustrated is in the case of Tesla was in his work again on radio in the period around 1900-1901. Tesla got money from J.P. Morgan, the famous banker, and he proceeded to build an elaborate laboratory on the north shore of Long Island just outside New York City. And there, he thought he was going to be able to transmit messages, or more importantly, power, around the world. The only problem was, is, is he was a little slow in getting all of this done. And in December of 1901, Marconi successfully sent a message from England to Newfoundland and, and was the first to wirelessly span the Atlantic and demonstrate the potential for radio. So you basically had taken money from J.P. Morgan, the most powerful man in the world, and uh, you, you're scooped by Marconi. So what do you do? Well, if you're Tesla, you go big. You say, don't worry about this stuff that that Marconi guy was doing. That's just, that's small potatoes. We're going to build an entire system that is going to transmit power and messages around the world. We're going to take all of the stock price information, we're going to take telegrams, we're going to take facsimile messages, telephone calls, the whole nine yards, and we're going to basically send it out to Long Island, pump it into the ground, and we're going to broadcast it all around the world, and people are going to have a device no bigger than a pocket watch that allows them to get all the news and information that they could possibly want. In other words, he's talking about a consumer electronics device the size of a cell phone, in 1902. Okay. Now, 
What's important there is, 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 is for, and for, our, for what we want to get across to our students is how much they have to think about the social and cultural values that need to be mobilized in that process of bringing a new disruptive technology into place. Okay, and there indeed is, is Tesla's tower. And one of my favorite pieces is, 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 you may not be able to see this, is the middle oval shows a, a splendid middle class woman who is getting the latest news from New York City while she's on vacation by holding up her parasol. And that's serving as the antenna. But we're never entirely satisfied. One of the, one of the things I've enjoyed hearing about here today is, 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 is that none of the programs that we've heard about, none of the, none of the, none of the, uh, the organizations that we've heard are, are entirely happy that there is a certain amount of, of an itch that has to be scratched, new things you have to be trying. So some of, what are some of the challenges that we're finding at the University of Virginia, at least on the technology entrepreneurship side? Well, I break them down into two things. One is you've got to nurture relationships not just among engineering students, but to integrate engineering students with students from Sean's program, or, or with, uh, pro, uh, with the Darden School, with students from uh, the, faculty, uh, the faculty or the College of, uh, of Liberal Arts. And we were trying to do that in a variety of ways. We're launching a new course next semester called iStartup, which will basically be a, a, a class that meets twice a week. The first, uh, the first class each week will be basically a lecture or, or present, a lecture course. But the lab section, which will be the second time each week, will be a mentoring laboratory where students will work in, in teams of three or four, but it, well, it's sort of several teams will then have a single mentor. No mentor will have more than 15 students total to, to deal with. Uh, I'm going to launch a course on entrepreneur, the entrepreneur in history, which is an opportunity for me to take, take the entrepreneurial message out to the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we have a, a, an idea for a course on engineers as consultants. We were actually were going to call, call the course Therapy for Engineers. Not that our engineers had personal problems that we were going to try to solve, but that they were going to be therapists in the sense that a lot of times engineers are brought into entrepreneurial, onto teams, entrepreneurial teams, because they have to listen and help solve the technical problems that the business people present. I don't know how I want to do this app. I think it's what it you know, go to this market, serve these customers, but how are you actually going to build it? So we're going to think about that. Uh, in the week after next, we're going to have our first technology venture fair, very similar to some of the things that they're doing down in Nashville at Vanderbilt, where we have basically uh, one, thing, one set of students are basically going to display their wares, their product ideas, and the business students are going to come in interact with those folks as well. We've also invited the law students to come over. The other issue is, is this is beyond the classroom. I worry a lot. What I've told you a lot about is curriculum this morning. And I, I seem to be able to keep coming up with ways to solve the kind of curriculum problems. But I always worry that once I, I turn a student on to entrepreneurship, that they do an interesting project in this class or that class, how do we follow through with them and make sure that they continue to get the mentoring and the resources that they need to bring that, pro bring that project into, you know, into full completion? So we have a series of things that we're working on in, the, in those regards, both laboratory and, and sort of hires that we're going to try to make. Okay. I mentioned before that um, UVA has a rich and complex ecosystem. Uh, we, th this one is, of course, the... the, the uh, the egotistical version, so there's the School of Engineering in the middle and everything else is sort of spinning out from around that. I apologize for that, but it makes a certain, well, it makes a certain sort of point, but, uh, but it is, it's, it's, we'll, we'll, talk, right? we'll talk, I know. You, you said you wanted the slides. <laughs> okay, but the, the, one of the things I thought about in listening to the other presentations is, is, is um, Sean and I, would you agree, Sean, we're pretty anarchical. I mean, it's, it's a lot of chaos going on at UVA. And some of that is, is, has an institutional base, which is it's a very decentralized organization. Okay, I work, I work for the engineering school. I've worked there for 25 years, and I am in that silo. And in fact, one of my jobs that's made it interesting is to help build up and get out of that silo and build up all of those relationships. But that may be also our strength, that the ecosystem at UVA is one where you have a thousand, a thousand flowers bloom, that you have a lot of different things going on, and that indeed what we're trying to do is, 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 is nurture a variety of different approaches to entrepreneurship, but given the nature 
of what kind of organization you, the University of Virginia is. So a couple final, uh, final thought, and then I will uh, be glad to take some questions, and I really want to kind of emphasize that uh, one of the things I learned in teaching engineering students is, is engineering students, <laughs> there's no problem coming up with ideas. You want more potato peelers? They'll come up with 17 potato peelers. The question is, is, is how do you take the best of those ideas and you shape it into a product? And entrepreneurship in a nutshell for engineering students is understanding that hard work, that process by which you get from idea to product. Okay, and that it involves creating networks of people, things, and ideas, what we call socio-technical enterprises. And it's only by doing that, by helping students develop those, those insights and skills, that we will reach that Schumpeterian motion of being able to harness the, quote, perennial gale of creative destruction. Thank you very much. So, uh Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, talking to a few entrepreneurs before, uh, or the entrepreneurs I know, um, the main challenges they are thinking about is to get the first project or the first cash flow, basically, to get liquidity and, and to move forward. Uh, in the ecosystem you showed, uh, which part of the ecosystem is supporting the entrepreneur to have the first push from the market, the first project or the first consultation, for example. So some, some of that support comes from, which I, I, I'm not going to talk about, I can't talk about effectively as the vice president for research and the, uh, and the licensing group. Um, and that they, they provide a certain type of, of, of actually, not necessarily cash support, but the re resources that students often need to get intellectual property or to get that. One of the things that we go back and forth on is the whole question of where, what kind of venture funding should students have. There is an active uh, angel network in Charlottesville and, and an investor community. So do, is there anything you would add to that? Well, I'm, 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 not, I'm not feeling, it's a very good question, yeah. but I'm going to turn to my colleague. Yeah, we can have one more last question. Uh, in your program structure, I find it a little bit strange that, you know, uh, IP is offered as elective. Don't you think that IP teaching, IP is very, very important for particular engineers? That, you know, protecting an idea is as important as the idea itself? Thank you. Oh, yes. No, that's the whole point. In fact, uh, I can't tell you for sure, but anecdotally, my sense is, is this is there are very few universities that offer an undergraduate course uh, in IP. And, and in my time as an engineering educator, uh, I'm time and again amazed to discover that I'm the history guy and I'm teaching them how to write patent applications. And so I completely agree that, that, you know, that teaching students or exposing students to certain basic principles of IP would be, if I ran the world, it part of, intro to part of, of your basic introductory to engineering class. And I also would, would emphasize, though, is this is not only important for the, the, the creation of economic value, that is to say that you, you actually get the idea down on paper, but it's again for this notion of that you write and then you know, that it helps shape their discipline, their, their discipline their minds and create a degree of analysis. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Carlson. Thank you.